Welcome everyone to lab 19, the topic of which is normal microbiota. Normal microbiota are defined as the microorganisms that typically reside on specific areas of the body or specific body systems. The human body, as we've learned, is absolutely teeming with microscopic organisms. There are trillions of them living on and inside of your body, and in fact, there are a larger number of microorganisms in and on your body than there are human cells. There are specific species of microbes that tend to reside on different parts of the body, including the skin, nasal cavity, throat, digestive tract, and reproductive tract. And in your lab activity in the background section, you can see some common examples of normal micro microbiota that reside in these areas and the roles that they play in those areas. In the lab, however, we are going to limit our focus to just two of these areas of the body. We are going to look at the skin and the throat. The goal of this lab is to take swabs of these two areas of the body and to inoculate them onto a variety of differential and selective media plates with the goal of being able to use the growth on those plates to identify which specific species are present in the throat and skin swab samples. Now, because you're not doing this video or not doing this lab in person, um, the swabs that are taken are not going to be from you guys, they're going to be from my skin and my throat. And the plates that they are going to be uh, inoculated onto include the chocolate agar plate, the Tinsdale agar plate, the mannitol salt agar plate, the blood agar plate, and the Sabaro agar plate. Some of these plates you've seen before. For example, you've learned about the mannitol salt agar plate and the blood agar plate in our differential and selective media lab. And you've also been exposed to the Sabaro agar plate. But just to be sure we remember what all of these plates do and to learn about the new ones, we're going to go over each of them and their functions here. The blood agar plate is differential for hemolytic species, meaning that it allows you to differentiate and identify species based upon their ability to destroy red blood cells. If a species is alpha hemolytic, it most likely belongs to the species Staphylococcus aureus. Alpha hemolytic species are the ones that partially destroy red blood cells, leaving a sort of greenish halo around the outside of the growth. If the growth on the plate is beta hemolytic, it is most likely Streptococcus pyogenes, and beta hemolytic activity means that the microorganism completely destroys red blood cells, leaving a clear halo around the outside of the growth. Gamma hemolytic species will grow on the blood agar plate, but they are unable to consume red blood cells and therefore there won't be any reaction around the area of their growth. The chocolate agar plate is similar to the blood agar plate in that it is enriched with red blood cells. However, the red blood cells in this case have been broken open and lysed which gives the chocolate agar plate a muddy brown appearance as opposed to the blood agar plate where you can still see the clear red pigmentation of the red blood cells. So the chocolate agar plate does not contain chocolate. It's only named chocolate because it contains lysed red blood cells. The chocolate agar plate is useful because it is selective and differential for species belonging to the genus Neisseria. Specifically, there are uh, two major species in this genus that have pathogenic capabilities that we're interested in. One of them is Neisseria gonorrhea, which is the cause of the uh, reproductive disease gonorrhea, and Neisseria meningitidis, which is one of the uh, main bacterial causes of the uh, central nervous system infection known as meningitis. If growth on the chocolate agar plate changes to a purple color upon the addition of an oxidase reagent, which has to be done after incubation has taken place in the lab, then that is indicative of a species being Neisseria. So for example, let's take a look at what that might look like on the plate. Here we have a chocolate agar plate. We can see that there is bacterial growth on the plate. And here the oxidase reagent has been added in this area. 
and we can see that there is a color change to this dark uh, blackish purple color. This indicates a positive reaction that this is a Neisseria species on the plate. Next we have the Tinsdale agar plate. The Tinsdale agar plate is useful because it is selective for members of the genus Corinobacterium. Specifically, Corinobacterium diphtheriae is the causal agent of the throat disease diphtheria. And so this type of agar is useful as an identifier for this species. When Corinobacterium is present, they show up as pinpoint, so very, very tiny black colonies on the plate. Other types of bacteria will not grow on the Tinsdale plate. Next, we have the Sabaro agar plate. The Sabaro agar plate is selective for fungus. So if growth is present, this means that the species on the plate is either a yeast or a mold. If the texture is mucoid or buttery, it is typically a yeast. And if it is fuzzy, it is typically a mold. Lastly, we have the mannitol salt agar plate. The mannitol salt agar plate is selective for halophiles, organisms that tolerate a high level of salt. And it is differential for organisms that can ferment mannitol. So you may remember that there are two main uh, members of this genus Staphylococcus that we're interested in. One of them is Staphylococcus epidermidis. The other is Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus epidermidis and Staphylococcus aureus will both grow on the mannitol salt agar plate because they are both tolerant of high levels of salt. However, only one of these will experience a color change because only one of them can ferment mannitol, thus producing acid and dropping the pH in the immediate vicinity of the growth. And that species is Staphylococcus aureus. We expect Staphylococcus epidermidis to grow, but to give no color change. So now that we know the purposes of each of these different types of plates, let's take a look at how they'll be inoculated. A throat swab will be taken and dunked into a tube of sterile saline. One loop of that saline will then be taken and inoculated onto each of the following plates. The throat swab will go onto the blood agar plate, an MSA plate, a chocolate agar plate, and a Tinsdale agar plate. The goal is to swab that loop across the entire surface of the plate in order to achieve individual colonies that can be analyzed. Likewise, the skin swab will be taken and dunked into a tube of sterile saline. And then the skin swab will be plated using a loop onto a blood agar plate, an MSA plate, and a Sabaro agar plate. So as you can see, we have different plates for the two different swabs. We're more likely to find fungus on the surface of the skin, therefore we use the Sabaro agar, agar plate here. We're more likely to find Neisseria and Corinobacterial species in the throat, therefore we use the chocolate agar plate and the Tinsdale agar plate here. So the results section will have all of these plates displayed for my throat swab and my skin swab. So I hope you enjoy checking those out.